Welcome everybody to the, the London launch of the latest strategic dossier of the IISS on the subject of missile defence cooperation um, in the Gulf. Uh, those of you who know us well will know that the ISS is always looking for um, opportunities in our research to try to fuse our regional security expertise with our technical uh, knowledge base. And in particular, we make efforts to assess how defense technical uh, developments are shaping the geopolitical environment uh, and vice versa. And this strategic dossier is, an, is one example uh, of that uh, approach. And it deals with an issue that we thought was both uh, salient and anomalous. Um, what I mean by that is that, on the one hand, it's clear that Iranian missile capabilities are strong and growing. But on the other hand, there has not been a commensurate, coordinated, uh, concerted attempt by the Gulf countries, who are not just theoretically but practically uh, most vulnerable to the challenge of Iran, to, uh, to, to, counter, to counter that challenge. And so in this strategic dossier, what we're doing is trying to do three things, really. First of all, um, assess what the nature of Iran's capabilities is to explain decision-making in the Gulf and policy in the Gulf up until this point, and then to set out uh, a roadmap for the future. What kind of missile defense capabilities could uh, the Gulf states acquire? And at each level, what uh, technical, political, and diplomatic investments would be required uh, to bring that about? And so we're going to have um, two presentations from the people who have produced the strategic dossier for us. First, we'll hear on the technical questions from Michael Ellerman, who is Senior Fellow for Missile Defense based in our, our Washington office, and then to take us through the geopolitical and the policy questions, Toby Dodge, Consulting Senior Fellow for the Middle East and a professor at the London School of Economics. So they'll talk for about 10 or 15 minutes each, uh, and then we'll have some questions. Mike. Uh, thank you, Adam, and thank you all for, for coming. Um, as Adam said, what, what this dossier does is try to capture um, the research, uh, interviews, workshops that uh, we held in, in, in the Gulf, um, modeling efforts um, and, and uh, research trips uh, to discuss with uh, the Gulf uh, senior military leaders and, and policymakers in the Gulf um, the role of missile defense in countering the threat of Iranian missiles. Um, the dossier starts off with um, our attempt to kind of quantify and qualify what the threat uh, that Iran's missiles actually pose are. And what we see is, is Iran's um, defense and deterrence strategy is informed mostly by the conflicts that they've seen in their region since the Islamic Revolution, ranging from the war with Iraq throughout the 1980s uh, the 1991 um, U.S.-led coalition to oust uh, uh, Saddam Hussein from Iraq, uh, the 2003 um, invasion of Iraq, as well as um, Hezbollah's uh, clash with Israel in 2006, in which uh, a large number of artillery rockets were used uh, in battle. Um, from these experiences, Iran developed, uh, Iranian strategists published and adopted the Mosaic Doctrine, which recognizes that the Islamic Republic faces um, conventional, uh, you know, conventional far forces in the region that are far superior to their own, and that they cannot take on the United States or US-led um, campaign against them. Um, so they, what they've done is chosen to resort to asymmetric capabilities. Um, at its core, the, the strategy has three pillars. The first is the use of proxy militias to act as a first line of retaliation if Iran were to be attacked. Secondly, the use of swarming tactics uh, in the Gulf itself, using small boats uh, to swarm and, and uh, concentrate an attack on a single uh, vulnerable target uh, and help impede any naval-led invasion. And finally, ballistic missiles, which would be used uh, and aimed at countries such as Turkey, the Gulf states themselves, um, uh, at, and Israel, uh, and U.S. forces in the region, with the aim of, of increasing the cost of any military action that someone uh, would choose to take against Iran. 
So against this uh, background, Iranian decision makers see their arsenal of ballistic missiles, um, which is the largest and most diverse in the region, as a way of projecting power, coercing rivals, um, but mostly to punish any would-be aggressor. But we've begun to see a little bit of a shift in this doctrine where they've now uh, focused some of their attention on developing more accurate missiles to actually be used on the battlefield. Now the arsenal consists um, of about two to three hundred Shahab one and two missiles. These are basically the, the old Soviet Scud B and C. They're capable of traveling 300 and 500 kilometers respectively. Um, this portion of the arsenal would allow Iran to target Iraq, portions of Turkey, uh, the eastern shores of the Arabian Peninsula, primarily with the aim of threatening the Gulf states or complicating any military security planning in the region. Iran also um, possesses a, a growing number of battlefield missiles. This primarily consists of the Fatah 110, Fatah 113, and some new systems. Uh, they like to rename them quite frequently when they uh, make small modifications. Uh, but these are, these are systems that are capable of c covering just two to 300 kilometers. This is not enough to span the waters of the Gulf. So the, their aim primarily is to be used in the extended battlefield, perhaps to attack um, um, gathering forces in, say, Kuwait, where the U.S. would likely build up their forces for any land-based uh, invasion. Um, so these have a, a practical uh, warfighting aim. Uh, Tehran also uh, possesses a, a probably about 100 uh, Shahab-3 Ghadr-1 missiles. These are essentially the Nodong. They did some extensive modifications to, to the Nodong uh, to increase the range uh, to about 1,300, 1,600 kilometers. Um, engineers in Iran have been working on a longer range system, a two-stage uh, solid propellant um, missile called Sajil. It's not operational. It's been in development for over a decade now. It's unclear why um, they're having trouble or struggling with the technology, uh, but it does appear that it's, it's hit a roadblock of some sort. Um, finally, Iran has also begun modifying the Ghadr ones to create the Imad missile. This is a, a system they tested about a year ago. Um, it appears to have what they hope will be a maneuvering warhead that separates from the main missile body. This would be done to enhance accuracy uh, but also to complicate um, uh, missile defenses because of its maneuvering capabilities. Um, it's only been tested one or two times, and it's, it's a long way off from actually being uh, a usable system uh, with the maneuverable warhead. Now, as I, it's important to note that none of Iran's missiles have the, the accuracy to destroy, with any sense of predictability or reliability, a point target. And this limits their military utility. Um, but Iran, as I said, has focused, uh, in fact, most of their focus on, uh, on recent activities, say, since about 2010, has been on enhancing accuracy so that they can become more effective military tools. But again, this is something that's going to take time, probably at, at five to ten years, to, to achieve what they hope to. Uh, nonetheless, they do have the capacity to, to disrupt operations on the battlefield, airfields, um, uh, ports, not enough to halt those activities, but certainly enough to complicate planning. Now, there are a number of ways in which the Gulf states, U.S. forces, U.K. forces uh, in the region um, can counter Iran's missiles. One could use diplomacy perhaps to contain um, the growth of the arsenal that Iran has or, or maybe prevent them or dissuade them from increasing the range. Uh, there are supply side restrictions um, which have limited utility at this point. Um, this is a debate that's being held in the U.S. Congress these days about further sanctions on Iran. I think they would be, um, they wouldn't be very useful um, or effective uh, operationally, but politically it might be important. You have passive defenses that one could conceive, uh, concealment, hardening of targets. But many of the, the primary assets that Iran would probably go after are large area targets like airfields, ports, um, assembly areas. Those you can't, 
practically hide or conceal. They're not as mobile, and therefore uh, they're more vulnerable, and you can't employ a lot of passive defense. I did want to make one note about civil defense. Um, a simple 30-second warning of incoming missiles allows people to take shelter, and you can reduce the casualty rates by about 50 percent. This is what was experienced during World War II uh, when you examine the, the fatality rates of the V-1, uh, kind of a, the precursor to a cruise missile, which was very loud and could be heard coming, and that of the, the V-2, the ballistic missile. So it, 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 it turns out to be almost precisely 50 percent savings. Uh, this is not something the Gulf states have opted to do, though. It would be cheap and easy, but it, it has been not, it's not been pursued to date. Now, there are three effective, what I would call quite effective means, um, preemptive strikes. Um, we examine this in some detail. In fact, Doug Berry did uh, most of the research on this. It's a challenging proposition. Many of you will remember from 1991 when the U.S. forces were searching for Saddam Hussein's Scud um, launchers. Uh, but technologies have changed considerably uh, with time. Um, having said that, given the size of Iranian territory and the, the, the terrain, it would be a very difficult task to prevent Iran from launching uh, their missiles. However, left of launch threats to their to Iranian forces would prevent them or complicate their ability to use mass fire or salvo fire, which is one of the countermeasures that they've been seeking uh, to, you know, to neuter or neutralize some of the effectiveness of, of the missile defenses. Um, it de degrades their ability to, to uh, coordinate, but it also attrits their forces over time. So it, it's a technology and a capability certainly worth pursuing as an adjunct to terminal missile defenses. Um, deterrence is something that the Gulf states have been talking about. Um, a number of states have thought about acquiring their own ballistic missiles. I think they have better options. One option would be to use their long-range uh, standoff weapons from aircraft because they have a far superior air force to that of Iran. Uh, it would be a more effective and meaningful uh, retaliatory uh, method. But they've got to articulate this strategy so that the Iranians understand that you know, missile attacks will be um, countered with offensive operations. <clears throat> Finally, there's the what I call deterrence by denial, and that is the use of terminal missile defenses. Um, terminal missile defenses intercept incoming uh, warheads or the missiles themselves while they're in flight towards the target. You have systems such as Patriot or MEADS. Patriot has been proven. Um, it was quite effective in 2003 uh, against Saddam Hussein's uh, short-range missiles. And the Saudis have had considerable success in Yemen intercepting uh, Scud and uh, Soviet Tochka missiles uh, that have been launched by the Houthi rebels. rebels. Uh, THAAD has been, ex uh, which is the terminal high altitude area defense that uh, is developed by the U.S. Um, it has had uh, great success on the test range but has never been used in battle and of course you have the Aegis system with the, which the U.S. has deployed around the world on boats and also on land in Romania and uh, eventually in Poland. I'd note that five of the six states in the, in the Gulf Cooperation Council, Kuwait, Bahrain, Qatar, the UAE, and Saudi Arabia, all have acquired or are on the path to acquire Patriot and THAAD systems. The U.S. forces in the region operate Patriot systems in four of those five GCC countries. Um, the UAE is in the process of operationalizing its first THAAD battery. Uh, it should go online, um, I think, by the end of this year. Um, and Qatar is, is in the process of purchasing two batteries. They may reduce that to one, and the Saudis are studying the possibility of, of buying either that or Aegis. Now, we, what we tried to do in, and spent most of the dossier on is looking at um, how one would conceive a notional architecture. Well, what should it look like and, and how would you plan to get there? I would first note that missile defense is a lot like air defense. You're not trying to intercept every missile that comes towards you. It's not an umbrella. It's not practically or feasibly possible uh, to create a perfect shield. Rather, what you're trying to do is minimize the amount of damage you're 
uh, opponent or adversary can inflict upon you, much as air defense does. So with that in mind, it's necessary when viewing a specific missile defense force structure is whether it's on the national level or regional level, what, what are you trying to do? Um, so in my view, we, we spend time talking about how uh, defense planners and strategists in the region would look at missile defense and determine what they need. So first, they need to determine what is to be defended. Are you trying to defend cities? Are you trying population centers, critical infrastructure, or military capabilities? Each of those then will impose the follow second requirement was how much protection is needed. How many missile strikes on a city or an airfield uh, per unit of time is allowable or, or, or acceptable? And from that, you can determine, uh, you can look at the probability of success and derive uh, the number of interceptors you need and the strategies, you need, firing strategies you need to employ. And then it, how much uh, missile defense is um, affordable. You know, it's, it, the more you put in, the more effective it'll be, but it, again, you have uh, tremendous costs because the systems are quite expensive. With those three measures in mind, or those three um, you know, objectives in mind, we use three measures to, to um, assess um, missile defense effectiveness. One is the size of the area, uh, territory that could be protected, the intercept deficiency, and the total size of the defense required. Using these measures, we looked at how missile defense operating, you know, each of them operating independently and how they, in various forms of integration or cooperation, how they would perform. And what we see, um, and there's lots of illustrations in the um, dossiers you have uh, before you, um, how the effectiveness, no matter which of those three measures you use, increases with the level of, of integration or cooperation you, you employ. As that increases, performance increases. We examine sensor sharing, integration, uh, whether it enables the queuing of, of um, fire control radars for individual units, the sharing of fire control <clears throat> data across remotely located uh, batteries, which would facilitate what they call launch on uh, remote or engage on remote. These are um, methodologies that one can use to increase the amount of territory that can be protected or increase the efficiency of intercept with fewer numbers of missiles. And then we looked at shoot, assess, shoot strategies. Again, these are, are uh, firing uh, doctrines that can be employed when you're cooperating with others because it gives you a larger battle space or what we call a kinetic window in which to operate. Um, just one note is uh, that the, the value of things like shoot, assess, shoot as opposed to barrage strategies is it allows you to handle the primary countermeasure that we've seen Iran um, uh, attempt to develop and that is salvos. Um, the more you can employ layered defenses, whether they're vertically layered or horizontally layered, um, the better your ability to handle that particular countermeasure. So with that, I'll stop and hand it over to Toby to talk about the, the prospects and, and the potential paths forward. Thank you, Mike. Thanks, Adam. Uh, I think the central puzzle of this dossier is that given Iran's stock of missiles poses a, a major conventional threat to the security of all the GCC states, and that the Gulf states' first discussed moves towards collective missile defense in detail in October 1982, why have they not achieved more progress? Now, previous progress on GCC collective defense happened when GCC threat perceptions, both internal and external, were at their highest in the aftermath of 1979, with, as we know, the Iranian revolution transforming the Gulf security area and the seizure of the Grand Mosque in Mecca by homegrown Saudi militants indicating the heightened level of domestic threat faced by GCC states. Now, this new level of both internal and external threat perception led to the formation of the GCC in May 1981. And you could argue, and I think quite persuasively, that GCC initial progress towards collective defense yielded some substantial results. The higher military committee was formed within the GCC 
General Secretariat 18 months after the establishment of the GCC itself. And then substantial progress was also made in defining the general objectives of the GCC military program. The high point, we could argue, of this agreement came with the formation of the Joint Peninsula Shield Force. More recently, the most notable success in air and missile defence cooperation came in 2001 when the so-called Belt of Cooperation became operational. This is a distributed command and control network that links air operation centres across the GCC, providing aircraft identification and tracking capabilities. However, this net network, although still in use, has major gaps in coverage. The network cannot be used to support missile defence operations because of its limited bandwidth capacity, and correcting this shortfall would require a significant upgrade to expand the amount of data that is received and transmitted in real time. However, however further moves towards defence integration have been blocked by what the dossier has labelled sovereign sensibilities of the individual GCC states, with basically the five smaller states of the GCC historically being wary of the power imbalance between them and Saudi Arabia. The influence of these sovereign sensibilities was rapidly increased after the initial creation of the GCC by Iraq's 1990 invasion of Kuwait. When faced with a very real material threat to their continued existence as states, GCC governments focused on direct uh, bilateral military agreements with the United States over any possible future collective security that could be delivered by the GCC as a whole. Against a background of limited progress towards collective defense, a contemporary growing threat perception and the strength of sovereign sen sensibilities Individual GCC states, as Mike has already indicated, have chosen to invest extensively in bilateral missile purchases, mainly from the US. These purchases have been driven by what we argue has been a totally transformed threat environment. When would we date that? Well, we could date it, I think, from, the, uh, from firstly the blowback from the invasion of Iraq by the US-led coalition and the linked rise in extremism and terrorism in the region. Now that, as we all now know, the failure of, uh, of um, the United States to establish stability in Iraq and then establish its own allies firmly controlling Iraq led to a resurgence in Iran's regional policy ambitions. Now the second thing obviously is the aftermath of the Arab Spring, which has highlighted to all the Arab Gulf states uh, the, the, again, their vulnerability domestically to uh, domestically driven mobilization, driven by economic and political discontent. But indeed, there's a third aspect that has magnified these two regional and domestic fears, and that's the Middle East policy of the Obama administration. The GCC's leading security guarantor clearly looked not only to extricate itself from two costly wars in Afghanistan and Iraq, but also address what it saw as its main global security concerns by the so-called pivot to Asia. So the ruling elites in the GCC saw in Yemen all of their collective uh, defense fears come together at once. And their response to the country's growing instability could just be a harbinger of increasing security cooperation across the board. Now, the campaign, as we know, was overseen by Saudi Arabia, which shares an unstable 1,600-kilometer border with Yemen, as it and other GCC states launched an extended air and then ground offensive against the Houthi forces, Operation Decisive Storm. Now, with the UAE and Saudi Arabia then placing troops on the ground. Now, this is the boldest joint but clearly not integrated military effort ever undertaken by GCC states. The campaign is a direct result of, new, of a new collective sense of threat felt by the organization's members in reaction to Iranian assertiveness, the cooling of American attitudes towards the Gulf, and the domestic threats rep re represented by the GCC. So looking at that, we're still faced with a conundrum about why yet this new threat perception, broadly comparable to the aftermath of 1979, hasn't led 
1979 did, to a great leap forward in collective security. So when we were thinking about this and our policy recommendations, we looked at the, examiner, we looked at the example of the North Atlantic Treaty Organization's own rather slow journey to collective missile defense. And that it, it, it indicates that a very high level of sustained political and di di diplomatic negotiations between the leadership of the GCC states at the Supreme Council, the head of state level of the GCC, not even the military council, and especially the ministerial council, and especially not the high military council, may be the only sustained way of achieving some form of optimal missile defense. Now, as we know, NATO began its internal deliberations about developing an alliance capacity for collective missile defense in the late 1990s. The NATO summit in Prague in 2002 formally called for a feasibility study that was co completed three years later. However, it was not until the NATO summit in Lisbon of November 2010 that the alliance leaders formally agreed to a plan that it would integrate the ballistic the missile, mi missile capabilities of individual states into an overall NATO system. It then took a further two years until NATO could declare its interim ballistic missile capacity, defense capacity. Overall, the 28 member states of NATO took over a decade to agree an integrated missile defense. Now, it was not technical integration that proved to be the time-consuming problem. This came at the end of an extended diplomatic negotiations. Now, in our workshops, we brought NATO experts on missile defense into the GCC and placed them in dialogue with GCC defense experts. And we got three lessons from that. The first lesson, I think, and the most important lesson for the GCC to arise from the NATO example is the dominance, quite simply, of political considerations over strategic and technical ones. The leaders of the states involved have to retain control over the whole process and be integrated into all the key decision makers. Again, it needs to be moved up to the level of key decision makers. Key states people have to drive the whole process forward if indeed they want it. It cannot be left as a technocratic issue to the military command. Now, the most important, and NATO, would, NATO defense experts would argue, the most contentious decision for senior politicians from all the alliance uh, have to degree on defense design. Central to defense design is reaching an agreement on what assets are going to be defended by an integrated system, the so-called uh, defended asset list. Mm. Now, there's, there's fairly solid examples that when the GCC have attempted to, to share their defended asset list, they've actually redacted key issues upon it, which I think shows the level of trust that needs to be uh, built towards. Now, complete, as Mike says, complete protection against all risks and threats is simply impossible. So politicians, if they go down this avenue, are going to be forced to make difficult choices about what risks pose the greatest threats, what assets are the most v v valuable to each state and society, and what means are available to reduce the threat to an acceptable level, but also an acceptable cost. Given the issues involved, it is very difficult, but not impossible to reach a consensus or a final uh, decision. And what the NATO experts stressed in these um, workshops that we held was this was the most politically toxic issue amongst NATO allies that they had to thresh out. The second issue that must be decided at a high level is negotiations around command and control. And then finally, the delegation of authority to order engagement has to be agreed upon. Who is delegated to make that decision? What are the rules of engagement? And finally, the conditions for the use of force. Now, all these issues can be helped by the creation of a GCC intellectual community of missile defense expertise, what we'd call in academia an, epi uh, an epistemic community of shared interest and intent. Now, it's interesting to note, again, going back to the NATO example, that 10 years ago, NATO didn't have a collective expert community on missile defense. What we had, I would like to suggest, is a group of US experts, 
By drawing NATO into an extended multilateral debate, this collective group, this epistemic community of like-minded individuals was created across NATO states. A senior leadership seminar worked for NATO uh, in, in building this consensus. And then finally, we need a base level target achievement that is simply sharing sensor uh, data across early warning, across the early warning sensors of the GCC. And of course, you could share data sensors because they can be turned off or on. So I think this dossier is neither optimistic or pessimistic about the possibilities of moving forward to collective defence, but it has mapped out, firstly, what the optimal rational approach to a missile architecture, a missile defense architecture would be. It's compared the post-1979 threat environment that led to the formation of the GCC and some substantial progress forward on military collaboration, identified when this stopped in the aftermath of Iraq's invasion of Kuwait, and then has looked at the current threat perception, the current threat environment, and sees it, I think justifiably, as broadly comparable. Then what we've done in the last instance is to say how we could move towards incremental, gaining incremental agreement at a, the top level of decision makers in the GCC, but also then building a community of experts, defence experts, both inside government and outside government across the GCC that could deliver the expertise and the consensus needed to walk, to walk towards this basic step of sharing sensor Data. Great. Uh, thank you very uh, much. Um, on the technical side, I think one of the strengths of this strategic dossier uh, is the, the maps, the charts, uh, the tables. They, they cover things like uh, missile ranges and payloads, uh, launcher types, uh, maps of missile bases, photos of missile bases in some cases, charts on kill probability, charts on effects uh, radius. Um, on the countermeasure side, um, uh, explaining really how Patriot systems uh, work and that uh, operates, uh, uh, and the things that Michael referred to with the intercept efficiency and uh, calibrated intercept strategies, and that all comes to life, I think, and the numbers are really crunched uh, on that. And then you also have on top of that some maps that look at coverage options by, by country and by region as a whole, and I think that um, that is a real asset of this uh, of this dossier. And uh, Toby, thanks for taking us through the issue of sovereign sensibility and, and some of the lessons that might be learned from the NATO process. And I wonder uh, whether there are also some analogies that might be drawn from some of the thinking being done in Asia around missile defense that might be transferable to, to the Gulf region um, as well. So we have about 25 minutes for questions, comments uh, from uh, the floor. Maybe I'll just kick things off uh, by asking the first one. Um, presumably there's a sense in which um, Iran thinks that the, the environment for acquiring these capabilities is, is permissive, um, but do you think there is um, a kind of a, a tipping point at which Iranian capabilities will reach such a, a, a prominence that this question of sovereign sensibility will, will, will melt away and the, and the challenge will be seen to be so urgent as to require a concerted uh, Response and if so, what would some of the indicators of that tipping point uh, be? It's a very interesting question. Um, you know, people uh, or observers of Iran have said over the last few years, um, and, and uh, with emphasis since the signing of the, the the nuclear deal, that Iran's missile forces are growing. And I'm not sure that that's exactly true. Um, if you look, and this, someone had asked a question in a previous launch, um, will missile defense uh, spark a kind of uh, arms racing in, in, the, in the Middle East or the Gulf region and, and push Iran to acquire more systems? And we just haven't seen that yet, at least overtly. I mean, they may be doing things that um, people like me looking at uh, their activities from open source information only, um, but they 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 appear two things. They appear to be focused on creating shorter range, highly accurate systems that will support battlefield operations, or 
probably more precisely, uh, I will use a term I dislike very much, but area denial. They want to deny an invading army the space um, adjacent to their borders, a, a position to assemble and, and gather forces for uh, possible invasion. Those missile numbers are growing and the Patriot systems, which are the short-range interceptors, will be challenged greatly by this. Um, and this is where, you know, sharing sensor data can prove to be very valuable for the operators of those, those Patriot systems. What we don't see is Iran seeking to produce, and this has been a mystery to me for some time, why they aren't building a thousand kilometer range solid propellant system. They, they have the technical capability. Um, this is, these are systems that would give, this, give them incredible flexibility. And it, they could be used in a way that would greatly frustrate missile defenses, but we haven't seen that yet. Um, so I don't know if that answers your question, but it, it's something that has been strikingly puzzling to me that the reaction to, to the acquisition of missile defenses has been quite muted. Um, it may be that, you know, in the next five to eight years, they're going to be able to um, purchase advanced strike aircraft. Um, and a big question amongst a lot of us that watch Iran is will the kind of the, the value, the, the psychological value that missiles have with Iranian planners and, and decision makers, will that begin to, to erode and be replaced by the desire to have, uh, you know, a, a more flexible, capable system that is advanced strike aircraft? I don't know the answer to that. I guess we'll have to see. I think uh, I'm skeptical about the tipping point in a way because I wonder how much worse things could get before collective security kit kicks in. And I think we can trace an accelerating anxiety about Iran's missile defense by the buying spree, to, quite frankly, that Kuwait, Saudi Arabia, Qatar have gone on mm -hmm. with increasing you know, um, THAAD, uh, pack, upgrading Pac-3 uh, batteries. And then we look at, I think, one, probably the most militarily advanced state in the GCC, the United Arab Emirates. And we see them pushing ahead very aggressively with their integration of their own missile defense. And we see, I think, sustained reports that the UAE is turning around and saying, you know, this is a, a two-speed GCC in, in missile defense, and, and we don't want anything to get in the way of our own sovereign defense capacity. So I think it's much more likely, as Mike says, over the next five years, that, that you'll see bilateral investment in hub and spoke deals with the United mm -hmm. States, not co collective defense. Yeah. Well, I was going to ask you, from, on the basis of the various interactions that you had in the region, did you have a sense as to who were uh, uh, the countries that were more forward leaning in terms of sponsoring missile defense cooperation as such, uh, rather than simply being very vigorous in their own uh, on bilateral uh, arrangements? Do you have a sense, of course, the spread of the GCC, where the momentum might come from? Well, I mean, clearly the most sophisticated thinkers uh, in the GCC about missile defense are Kuwait and uh, UAE, and they actually face quite different threats, uh, which is interesting in and of itself. Um, Bahrain itself doesn't appear to be too interested because it has what I call collateral coverage because the Fifth Fleet is there and there are two Patriot batteries, and the size of Bahrain is such that the Patriot batteries um, cover a great deal of the territory, specifically uh, Manama, the capital city. Um, but that assumes that, uh, that, that um, the, the U.S. would extend that coverage when the, their primary objective is to, to control the, uh, the, the bases. Qatar is a, is a very different example where they're doing a, uh, or in the process of purchasing a considerable amount of, of, of equipment. Uh, and it, there's a fundamental question of how they're going to man it. Uh, it's uh, a Patriot battery requires about 150 to 160 personnel. And if they're going to buy 10 batteries or 11 batteries, um, that's 1,500, uh, 2,000 highly skilled, highly trained mm -hmm. folks. Um, but in terms of cooperation, I, I think the UAE sees the value of it. That's why internally they're doing integration. Um, but I haven't seen their interest um, kind of proliferate uh, greatly because they're so focused on what they're doing. Mm -hmm. 
But I, it's important to note, and Toby touched on this, it took NATO 20 years to get to the point where they are today, and they're not where they really want to be. Um, you know, this is a long, slow process, so I think those that are, that view the Gulf states, the GCC, you know, they've been at it for four, five, six, seven years. Um, I, I think we're being a little unfair in assessing the, the progress that they've made today. I think we also could compare the different historical trajectories of the two examples that, that Mike identified the United Arab Emirates and Kuwait. Now, Kuwait, in the past, you could argue, has been somewhat reticent about political integration, intelligence integration across the GCC. But the senior figures in the Kuwaiti military would argue because of their experience in the aftermath of 1990 1991, for example, their navy fleeing and having to be based in other, in, um, I think, in, in Manama, in, in Bahrain, but other. GCC states, the fact that they have to heavily integrate with the United States in liberation and its aftermath means that they appear and their, their high command and their leadership, uh, political leadership, uh, appear to be much more open to the notion of collective mi military defense, whereas Mike is saying the UAE clearly has grown tired of that. And, and we could take the case of Oman, which is somewhat of an outrider that clearly developed the first plans within the GCC for military integration in a GCC army and then has clearly cooled on the, the, the whole integrator, inter, military integration argument as its threat assessment has rebalanced and it's seen itself as benefiting from a more singular approach. Good. Um, so, any questions or comments from the floor? Yes, Paulina, just uh, wait for the microphone to reach you, just in the front row. Hi, Paul and I, so it's the IISS. Um, very briefly, one of the ideas that you mentioned in the dossier is the potential for negotiations um, with Iran and GCC and Israel. Um, that those negotiations would, I guess, out of necessity, focus purely on the range of missiles, um, with partly because Iran on numerous occasions has mentioned um, that the range that it has currently is sufficient. Uh, my question, though, would be, I suppose the U.S. would have to be involved in some shape or form. Or would the, U the U U.S. Uh, European allies have to be involved as well? Because considering the ranges, if that was uh, not the case, would that risk decoupling U.S. allies from the whole process? Thank you, Paulina. Um, you obviously know what I'm doing on other projects. <laughs> um, no, I, I think the, the notion of a, a trying to create an agreement that contains the growth of uh, range capability uh, for Iran, um, it has merit on s several levels, in, in my view. Um, the, the actual countries involved in negotiations don't get that much out of it, as you said. What this would do is, is limit Iran's ability to threaten southeastern Europe or beyond, um, which for the Europeans, that's very good and would be worthwhile, and I would think that they would be very supportive of it. Um, but the other idea behind this, you know, some kind of negotiation, is the first step towards possibly a WMD-free zone in, in the region, which I think um, many people, including uh, states within that region, uh, would favor. But it was the idea was to create transparency and confidence-building measures and to understand more um, thoroughly and comprehensively what Iran sees as a role for its ballistic missiles. I think the strategic dialogue that would be had and the increased transparency of what Iran is really capable of doing would be beneficial for all parties. Likewise, um, you know, if, if the Saudis would uh, forfeit or surrender uh, their DF-3, it's an uh, intermediate range missile they purchased from uh, the Chinese back in 1987, I believe it was. It's a system that they don't really need. They've replaced it with more capable systems, uh, according to uh, many observers uh, of Saudi Arabia. So I, I think the, because Iran says they don't need it, um, you know, I, I think Israel's primary delivery platforms are aircraft and cruise missiles. I, I think there's a, a deal to be had, and 
the benefit to it isn't so much on the missiles, but it's the creating transparency, uh, creating dialogues, and creating um, a, a community of and a bureaucracy within each of the countries that promotes arms control um, type confidence building measures. I think it would just be good for the region. Um, the, unfortunately, I think that the the tense relations between the Arab states and the and the, and the Iranians and, and of course the Israelis is it, it may not be the right moment at this point, but it's worth pursuing. Thank you. Yes, gentleman in the second row. Uh, thank you, thank you, three of you, for briefing and sharing. Uh, I'm from Chinese Embassy. Uh, my question is, could you explain the um, any links uh, strategically or operational or the technical uh, the links uh, between the two systems, one is the Gulf, uh, Gulf Missile Defense System and another is European uh, Missile uh, Defense System. And uh, for example, at which point is, um, uh, they are overlapped, or uh, what kind of elements they are embedded in each other's uh, systems. Then, thank you. Um, that's a very interesting question uh, in many regards. Right now, um, I don't believe there are any visions, uh, at least uh, in the U.S. planning, to try to integrate the, whatever integrated system appears in the Gulf with the European sy um, system. Uh, that doesn't mean that, that individual elements within those architectures might share information. An example is, um, I believe it's still there, uh, the, there's a, a forward-based X-band radar. It's essentially a THAAD radar operating in the surveillance mode in Van, Turkey, which is to provide early warning and cueing and early tracking information for the Aegis system um, that's, that's positioned uh, currently in Romania and one that will be in Poland later. Um, that system could also be, in principle, be used to inform uh, radars and, and missile defense batteries that are located in the Gulf itself. Um, I would be surprised if the U.S. Uh, Aegis cruisers, for example, aren't queued by the VAN radar for missiles launched from the northeastern territories uh, of Iran. Um, it also forms a, a good surveillance uh, to track missile testing in Iran. Um, so you have some of those systems that would be used. I don't envision um, the forward base radar in the Negev Desert being linked to any of the Gulf um, uh, radars and vice versa, at least not in the foreseeable future without major political changes. Um, in the end, I think you know, a long-term goal might be for the U.S. to integrate all of these systems uh, across, you know, whether they're located in, in um, North Asia, the Gulf, Europe, uh, but uh, practically speaking, I don't think those plans are moving forward very quickly. I just add that um, in reality, at, at this point, you know, today, um, THAAD and Patriot batteries don't talk to each other. Um, on the battlefield. They can on the test range because they kind of jury rig things. But th these are some of the challenge, technical challenges uh, that, that integration and cooperation faces in the, uh, in the near to, to midterm. I don't know if that addressed your question, but I think I know why you were asking the question, because the Chinese have been very concerned with what's happening in North Asia. <laughs> I don't want to put words in your mouth, though. <laughs> But I will. <laughs> uh, any final questions? Or Yes, uh, Tom right at the back of the hall, and then the gentleman here in the second row. Thanks. Hi, I'm Tom. I'm a researcher here at the uh, Institute. Um, I think uh, in your chapter on uh, the Iranian missile capability, you talked about the possibility of sticking a GPS receiver on, I can't remember which one, but on one of the missiles to improve the accuracy. If they were able to do that, do you, um, do you have any thoughts on how difficult it would be to deny them access to the GPS for military use uh, once they've stuck, stuck it on top of the missile? And uh, my other question was, um, do you see any, um, we've already seen S-300 batteries delivered to the Iranians from, from the Russians now that sanctions have started to be 
lifted. Um, do you see any possibility of Russian cooperation on missiles in the future? Um, I think in your, in your chapter you said uh, the SUMAR is based on the K-55, which originally air launched. Is there any possibility of them working together to do an air launch version of SUMAR in the future or you know, something like that? I'd be interested in your thoughts on that, those subjects. Thank you. Thank you. Um, let me go to GPS first. Uh, with the systems that Iran currently fields, um, you know, the Shahab series, the Ghadr, adding GPS um, would improve the overall accuracy of those systems maybe by 20, 25 percent because the actual navigation um, uh, errors are pale in comparison to what we call thrust termination errors, which are the largest source of, of, of dispersive uh, inaccuracies um, and GPS doesn't help you there. If you have a maneuvering warhead or you're, you have some post boost control then GPS could be more uh, effective and in fact this is what Iran, we think Iran is doing with the Fatah 110. It, it, uh, it flies only 200 kilometers because it stays within the what I'll call sensible atmosphere, probably below 40, 45 kilometers altitude where it can maintain positive aerodynamic control throughout flight. Um, here GPS could be an effective tool to update the inertial navigation system, uh, much like the U.S. and, and others use stellar updates to uh, before GPS was around. Denying the GPS signal uh, is certainly possible. Um, I would I would be surprised if Iran is not looking to diversify to use other um, means. Uh, you know, you can use ground-based navigation aids, uh, you know, differential GPS, and then there's, you know, there's the growth of, of alternative systems. Um, but I, I think it's, in the long term, it's, it's an area of concern. In the next 10 years, uh, it's, I, it, that's not what I worry about as much as the other things. S-300, um, you know, Russia has long been wanting to, to sell S-300 to Iran. Um, you know, in some of the UN Security Council resolutions, there were actually some steps taken to allow them to do it as soon as some of the sanctions were lifted. Um, but it, just because S-300 uses a missile for its intercept capability, it, you know, people often want to conflate interceptor missiles with ballistic missiles. Yes, a lot of the technologies are similar, um, and there are things that the Iranians could learn in operating S-300 and, and to enhance their, their ballistic missile capabilities. Um, but I, I think those are reasonably manageable. Um, Iran, I mean, uh, Russia cooperating on ballistic missiles, um, it may be done illicitly. I don't think it would be a form of state policy. Uh, you know, the, the Russians were in Iran uh, helping them in the 90s, early 2000s. Um, I've actually interviewed a number of the scientists that were there in Iran. Um, I, I don't see a repeat of that forthcoming. Um, but again, things could change dramatically um, over the course of, of the next 10 years. On the, the KH-55, it was my understanding, and I think Doug Berry, if he's still here, would, would correct me if I'm wrong, those were transferred from Ukraine um, illicitly, not from Russia itself. And I think what they got was a small number of those systems. I don't know that they got a lot of technical assistance from the Ukrainians. Uh, the Ukrainians kind of came clean after they were caught red-handed. Um, so I think there would be a, a disincentive for them to, to help them with uh, you know, developing a, a more robust or larger arsenal of, of uh, KH-55s. Thank you. And then here in the, uh, the second row. Uh, thank you. Um, uh, Nicholas Wade from the Foreign Affairs Committee uh, in the comments. Uh, Two quick questions, maybe they're yes or no answers. Um, when you were reviewing the missile defense market out, out there, do you think um, Israel's Iron Dome has caused any attention in, in the Gulf region, or is it just a completely different horses for courses weapon which would easily be overwhelmed by Iran's capabilities? And has Iran put anything into developing anti-ship missiles, or again, is this just a technology it doesn't need, um, 
given its, as you call them, area denial sort of tactics and the fact that maybe an aircraft carrier would be redundant in a conflict against Iran. But I would just wondered if it had put any efforts into that. Thank you. Iron Dome is a very capable system, but it's designed to go against short range, you know, mortars and very short range rockets up, you know, 20, maybe 40 kilometers. There's some very innovative uh, technologies incorporated into Iron Dome, especially the software, um, when it decides to shoot, when it doesn't, how it actually approaches the intercept. Uh, it, it's actually, it's a very impressive system. But I, I could see countries being interested in that technology to protect against mortar fire, not against ballistic missiles per se. Uh, I would note that there, you know, some U.S. contracts. I think Raytheon and now Lockheed have some systems that are approaching similar performance capabilities. Um, I don't know that they're as sophisticated as Iron Dome is now. The Israelis have been working on this uh, with uh, U.S. partner companies uh, for quite some time. But um, I could, I mean, I would see a, an eventual market for Iron Dome uh, across the world um, in the future. Um, Anti-ship missiles, uh, Iran already has, uh, you know, I, I think it's, again, I'll call on Doug to, to be more specific if I get something wrong, but, you know, the C-801, 802 types, uh, these are kind of cruise missile, anti-ship missiles. Um, but Iran is claims to have developed uh, the Halij Fars, which is a, uh, it's based on the Fatah 110. They claim it's optically guided and can target mm -hmm. ships. Um, but I'm rather skeptical of that capability at this point. Um, I think they're certainly capable of, of developing it over time, but it will require many, many tests. It would also require them to develop the targeting capacity, real-time targeting capacity. That's much more difficult to achieve. I think the, you know, the, the Chinese have been working on the DF-21 uh, anti-ship missile. Uh, they've made great strides. It's an impressive system. Um, but I think in the long run, the, the targeting and battle uh, damage assessment and all those things that go with it um, that make it a real challenge. And, and so I think Iran has a long way to go there. But with the cruise missiles there, they can threaten ships. Excellent. Well, that brings to the end uh, this session. Um, at the very conclusion of the, uh, of the dossier, looking out into the future, uh, you make the observation about um, uh, the political sensitivities and suggest that maybe there are ways in which they can be overcome simply with reference to the facts. The organization has only got six members. Uh, NATO uh, has 28. They have a similar frame of reference in terms of their security uh, concerns. They face a similar uh, uh, threat, a simpler threat than NATO did, rather. And... Uh, Integrated missile defense is cheaper than uh, distributed uh, um, individual options. So I know the next stop on your rollout tour is actually the Manama Dialogue on the 9th to the 11th of December, uh, where the regional security establishment of the Gulf is going to be uh, present. You're going to be uh, launching it there, so we'll see uh, how uh, compelling and persuasive your arguments are found to be there. But uh, in the meantime, thanks to all for coming, and thanks to you guys for presenting. Thank, Thank you. you.